Hello folks, Shady Wessel back here with another episode of the Wildcat Breakdown. This will be episode 4. Obviously I'm your host, J.D. Wessel, and I'm joined here by Jaden Cover, Andrew Pfeiffer, and Craig Sullivan. Craig is one of our newer hosts that we've had. Not host, he's actually just a guest. <laughs> but what we're talking about today is Mike Riley's firing, and obviously there's a lot of opinions about it, but a lot of the opinions that we have seen from Husker fans have been the displeasingness of Mike Riley being the coach and obviously ending a 4-8 and eight season this season, you know, ending his Husker career 19-19 and 19 as the head coach. So let's get your thoughts first, Jaden. What are your thoughts on the firing of Mike Riley? Um, you know, you feel bad for the guy because regardless of how he was as a coach, you know, probably one of the nicest people we've ever seen at the Helms in Nebraska. Um, you know, he was able to handle this entire situation well, but everyone knew it was going to happen. It was the best thing for Nebraska, and I think it's going to be the best thing for Mike Riley in, in the end because he was in over his head. Well, you know, going 19-19 and in the first three years of coaching a D1 college, which he has had experience doing, you know, at Oregon State, mm -hmm. but uh, turning a program that was in the hands of Pelini, which was at a steady 9-4 and four record for the past three or four years, and having to take that program and get a 19-19 and 19 record in three years is a very... I want to say mediocre job. I mean, mm -hmm. it was the we were in the right position to fire Mike Riley, but um, yeah, I I got nothing else to say about that. Well, yeah. people often overlook is with Bo left. It was a very toxic situation. He turned some players against Nebraska, against Sean Eichhorst, and Eichhorst went out and he made a hire that was opposite of Bo Pelini. Instead of looking at what could possibly be the best solution going forward, something that Bill Moose is not going to overlook. When talking about Mike Riley, everyone needs to understand he did handle it well. He did not like go sound off. He was even there at the press conference and Moose fired him. He was pure class. He left the program, I think, in a better state than Bo did, player wise. Oh, yeah. He got some good players coming here. We'll have to see how it progresses. No, no when I, I this takes me back a few years ago. I remember when Bo Pelini got fired, he held a player meeting at Lincoln High High School and he pretty much got all the players together and from what I heard, reportedly he trashed the program and handled it a completely different style than the way Mike Riley did. Mike Riley held his poise, and I just thought it was, you know, he handled it pretty well, like you well, said, Craig. Kind of picking up, piggybacking off both of you, um, you know, you can definitely tell just how much Mike Riley has a person meant to the players, um, as a coach as well. Um, when Bo got fired, you know, there were players defending him, but it wasn't as noticeable as it was with uh, Mike Riley. I know I've been on Twitter this weekend, and every Nebraska player has been, you know, like, saying thank you to Mike Riley for being not only a coach, but like a second father figure. We saw, um, you know, just anyone that kind of knew him is, as a person is kind of taken aback by him being fired. Even though he knew it was coming, it still kind of stings for a lot of the players. Well, I mean, like you said, when Bo Pelini got fired, I mean, there was a little bit of change in the program, but nothing really impacted the players terribly much. Now you got Mike Riley leaving the program, and there's lots of people wanting to transfer now away from Nebraska mm -hmm. for their senior years, going to other schools. Including Stanley Morgan Jr., who's, you know, arguably the best player on the team. I would say he's probably mm -hmm. the best player on the team after this season. And when I saw Stanley Morgan tweet that out, and then also saw Keyshawn, a player who was supposed to be on Huskers this season, I saw Keyshawn tweet towards him, like, thinking about it, and, you know, it just really shows that Mike Riley put a big impact on the guys, and obviously seeing him get fired hurt a lot of the players, and I think for some of the players that, you know, Stanley Morgan, what is he going to be, a junior or senior? Senior. 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 Next He's going to be a senior, and obviously it's tough for a player like him to go through that process of a new coach again. Mm -hmm. So I think him just being displeased is more him liking Mike Riley or also him not wanting to have to go through that process again. Yeah, it's very tough for Stanley Morgan. I think he's more talking about going towards the draft. He, did, mm -hmm. he was one of the leaders in the Big Ten among receiving yards. And it's tough for people, they don't think about Morgan. Morgan was recruited by the Bose program. He's been dealing with Riley's program. He likes Coach uh, Dub, Coach Keith Williams, who may not be coming mm -hmm. back. I know a lot of the wide receivers are talking about that. This would be his third coaching program in 
four or five years, that's not really a recipe for success for people when you have to learn a new system, possibly, a new coach coming in. You know, just having him go through that, it'll build uh, handling adversity in situations like that, which especially will help in the NFL when you're handling the problems like that. Because when you're in a pro team, you never know who you're going to play for. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's going to help him in the future, yeah. dealing with all these coaching situations, as well as preparing him for the draft. Should he leave Nebraska for his senior year and head towards the draft? I really can't say. Most Nebraska fans will say no. No, exactly. <laughs> but he could rise potential for himself in the NFL. Just yeah. I got it. I just got a butt in, Andrew, and, uh, you know, if, if I'm Stanley Morgan here, you know, I know you're saying that's going to help him prepare for the draft, but college is a time where you get to control where you want to go. You know, when you're in the NFL, you have no control over what's happening. It's all about the owner. You're, you're just a pawn in their little game. You're, you're completely at the mercy of them. In college, why wouldn't you want to have control? I mean, like, does he want, especially let's say he goes, plays another year under another staff at Nebraska. So that's three coaching staffs in five years at Nebraska. Goes to the NFL. That's four coaching staffs in six years. He just wants some steady ground. And he's hoping that he can just find that going out of the NFL and hopefully make his way onto a roster and ease into it. Rather, I mean, I, I get where he's coming from. As a Nebraska fan, I think he should come back, but I see where he's coming from. I'd agree with that. And kind of just to quickly sway over to a new topic what I was thinking about you know just right after the season ended is who will be our starting quarterback this upcoming season I mean we have three quarterbacks that have a serious potential to be the starting quarterback we obviously saw Tanner Lee start the whole season you know given the concussion but I mean for Tanner Lee do you think he has a good shot to return as starting quarterback you know, it obviously depends on the coaching staff and, you know, who's in there and what they like. But, you know, from what we saw this season, do you think we might be seeing a change? Well, it depends on the coaching style, honestly. You know, you see Tanner Lee is more of a pocket passer. He doesn't really he – he's not very mobile outside the pocket. Uh, we see – also we have Patrick O'Brien and Tristan Jebbia. And Patrick O'Brien's kind of similar to Tanner Lee. He might be a little more mobile than Tanner Lee. We haven't really – know because we haven't really seen him play in mm-hmm. games much. And Jebbia is a redshirt. Redshirt freshman, he hasn't played a single down yet in this season, so uh, a lot of potential for these two young players. And plus, you even got Darlington. Oh, Darlington's yeah. very underlooked. I don't think a lot of people really notice him. And uh, he was on the uh, he was on the uh, point after attempts in the field goal. He would be the holder, and uh, a lot of people underlooked him. But uh, I believe that he could get some playing time eventually in a quarterback if situations were to go the way they were. See, I don't see Darlington switching from wide receiver. I think he's too late into it to make that change. Um, but it, I think it all depends on what coach we have in here. If we get another pro style like Mike Riley, we're probably going to see Lee for another year just because, you know, he's been there at least. He may not be the greatest, but great, <laughs> be that great, but he can at least get you through year one. But I think if we see someone come in with a spread offense, you know, similar to what Scott Frost running at UCF, I really like what Jebbia shows. I watched him in the spring game, and I think he was the best quarterback there. Obviously, that's not against, you know, the Wisconsin's defenses, and it's not even against our ones necessarily. But I like that he poses as a dual threat option, and I'd like to see Nebraska get back to some read option. Because I think if you don't have a mobile quarterback, in college football right now, you're going to struggle. You know, one thing, I don't, I'm not taking anything away from Tanner Lee. I like Tanner Lee. I think he's a great passer. I just don't think he's mobile enough. But when he, looking back at before the 2017 season, when Tanner Lee went to the uh, Manning passing camp, the Peyton Manning quoted that he was one of the best passers there. Just the potential showing for this young man, especially heading into his senior year, transferred from Tulane, he could make a big impact in the NFL running an actual pro-style offense because running a pro-style offense in college football just isn't something you want to see, especially from Nebraska, which has never been done, ever. Mm-hmm. And look what it leads to. It leads to a worse record than since 1961. For sure. And, you know, to talk about the running game, like you guys were saying, to run that read option, I think it, you know, it ultimately, it ultimately is just having that alternate option because from what we saw this season – you know, we can't really settle with the running game considering we finished, what, 
113th in the nation in rushing. And obviously that's not Nebraska football. That's not what we – kind of the tradition that we've grown into. We need to get back to the running game, and I think having a mobile quarterback, having that second option, second or third option on the running game, that gives Nebraska a whole new widespread opportunity oh. to – Run the ball. Well, we definitely need that because they're. Um, I went to a couple games this year. I tried to avoid watching them on TV. And I gotta be <laughs> honest, but from the games I went to, you know, I'd pay attention to when we're handing the ball off, what the backside D end and the backside backers did. Because a lot of times those guys go unblocked. It was just not a lot of men up front. They crashed so far down. It, Tanner Lee would have pulled one of those, and he's a slow guy. I mean, we all know that. I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to beat him in a race, but <laughs> he's he's not D1, you know, speed to where he can pick up a bunch of yards. But mm -hmm. even if he pulls that, you know, you're looking at five yards at least. They were crashing so far down and committing to the run that our linebackers, I mean, our running backs, and sometimes our line didn't stand a chance of picking up everyone just because – there was no other threat than we're handing the ball off to a running back. That was definitely a huge problem for our offense. It was not only our uh, Tanner Lee couldn't move in the pocket, it was as well as our line couldn't pick up the blocks that we needed, like you said, Jade. And sometimes it'd be almost impossible for linemen to pick up blocks like that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think uh, our program is starting to recognize that that style of offense doesn't work for college football. And uh, I, some of the options here that they're looking at for hiring a new head coach was uh, Kim Neoma. Yeah, how do you say his name? The Navy head coach, uh, Nayam Adalolo. See, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that triple option can't work because, you know, Tarmont's run obviously won a few national championships running the triple option. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure in today's day and age we can get that. And I just don't think we have the personnel yet. I mean, back in the 90s when, you know, that's when it was, we were running that. We had, you know, these nasty linemen that would just get after it. And, you know, we'd have the fullback to get downhill quickly. And we'd have the personnel to do it. If he was to come in, we'd be sitting at 4-8 and eight for at least another three years just because we'd be able to get nothing going offensively. We don't have the personnel to run. And that would be enough time for other teams that would play us to figure out how we run the option and give them enough time to be able to defend it, even if we did have the yeah. good players. Well, and a lot of people forget, Nebraska did run the triple option. But that wasn't all we ran. All Navy runs is a triple option. I mean, mm -hmm. Nebraska would line up in an I formation a lot of times, and they'd pitch it to Lawrence Phillips, Amon Green, and we'd get a lot of just basic, you know, power, toss, ISO, those plays coming at you, you know, what you see a lot of just pro style running the NFL. And we had a good play action threat. I just don't think, you know, Navy runs an op their, their triple option isn't what Nebraska's triple option. I don't think Nebraska right now has a running back to run triple option. People do forget Trey Bryant only played in two games this year. He was less than 200 yards behind the leading rusher for Nebraska. That's not good. So, I mean, when you're looking at that, people forget Trey Bryant will be back. He'll be a good running back that we can lean on. He was very good during the first two games he was playing against probably mediocre opponents. So, I mean, there's nothing really he can do too much about that. When you're looking at coaches that run the triple option, That'll probably be good enough to beat the Minnesotas and Northwesterns, but you're not going to beat an Ohio State, mm -hmm. a Michigan, or like top level Penn State, Big Ten teams running a triple option. That seems like something that can keep you competitive and kind of outsmart the mid to lower teams, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to be a successful strategy going forward. You know, the one benefit, though, would be, you know, if all we're doing is running the ball, the clock runs out, and we're only losing 30 to 3 instead of, you know, 60 to 3. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, let's just go straight into who we want as our head coach. I mean, if we'd have to pick, and I think a lot of people can say Scott Frost is the right guy. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. And obviously everyone in Nebraska has him at the number one. What are you guys' thoughts on not only Scott Frost, but some other coaches that we've heard kind of around the silo? Just, how, okay, first of all, I want to focus back on Scott Frost. How do you not give this guy the job? Husker legend. He took a team that was 0-12 last year to 12-0 two, two years ago. Well, still. He took a team that was 0-12 two years ago to a team that's now 12-0, ranked 13th in the nation right now. Maybe first ever coach to do it. 
they're the they're only one of the still undefeated teams in college football right now. I think uh-huh. them and one other team Wisconsin. maybe because Alabama lost, you yeah. know, this weekend, and I think it's just huge how Scott Frost was able to move this program so much with you know the team that he had. I mean, you look at Florida and. There's not a lot of football fans. Like their games drew maybe forty thousand people plus. You know, maybe not that many people. You got half the size of Memorial Stadium. Not as cool as an atmosphere, but you got a guy that took his program to the next level, which is you know I would like to see Nebraska play UCF, and I'd like to see you know I think UCF could even potentially beat Nebraska. You know, oh, because, oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 easily, yeah, <laughs> easily, and I think. Just showing that, I think Scott Frost would be a perfect fit in Nebraska. Obviously, we've heard the rumors going around, uh-huh. you know, the seven years, $355 million uh, deal. 35. Thir- th- that's what I meant. 35. That's yeah, a lot yeah that's a lot of money. <laughs> Cause, but you got to consider right here that they're still paying off. They just finished paying off Bo Pelini. Or they're still, they're, they may be finishing it up. January 2019. They're also still paying off Sean Eichhorst, or how do you say his last name? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, I got, yeah, I got it right. Um, and then they're still they're going to be paying off Mike Riley uh, for years to come. So you got to consider your options here. But I think Mike or er, excuse me, Scott Frost is for sure. I mean, I'm going to be Husker biased here. Like I think he's. Well, I mean, the I wouldn't even say it's Husker bias. I mean, he went to Nebraska. Mm-hmm. He played for the team. Won a championship. <laughs> he's got family that lives there, that yeah. lives here in Nebraska. Uh-huh. And another thing about UCF. How far will he take that program? That's I think this season is as far as he could ever get UCF to go. Mm-hmm. The schedule strength will never be there. Even if you play out of conference, you're not guaranteed a 12 and 0 season you have every to year. Play, you know, the yeah. Bama's four times. You year. have to go undefeated if you play for UCF to even have a chance at a national title. Like let's look at Boise State back in. Oh yeah, it yeah. Was, it's the same situation with Boise State. Yeah. It wasn't a. You go undefeated one year. You had to go undefeated the next three year, or four years. Year yeah. Here's here's the thing about that. A lot of people, some people underlook Frost because they're like, oh, maybe he's having a good season. Like remember Nebraska last year, how we were having this great season and then we got blown out by Ohio State. Yeah. <laughs> it was still a decent season. Yeah. It was like kind of like a Bo Pelini season uh-huh. in similarity record wise. Well, but yeah. if you look at Frost, win the game and you're supposed to win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, obviously Mike Riley couldn't get it done. But when you look at Scott Frost here, he's not only winning games, but he's averaging 48 points per game. Yeah. Good good football teams will average uh, high points like that. The thing I like about Frost is, you know, he took an 0-12 team, and the first thing he basically told his players was, uh, you know, it's, uh, he's like, I, I see a lot of, like, he's like, this team is not 0-12 talent-wise. And I think what we saw with Riley is we weren't the we weren't a four and eight talent team. We had a lot more talent than that. So Frost obviously was able to get in there, not even get his recruits settled in. You figure, you know, let's say he started his recruiting class the year before, you know, he started out. You're looking at maybe at the most he got some red shirt sophomores or just true sophomores. Like that's the farthest he's gotten of his recruits. So he was able to take someone else's recruits and turn them into a good football team. The bad side, though, is we, we haven't seen what he can do as a recruiter yet. Um, it's it's very tough to tell what he's going to come in here. I think what we will see is, I know Craig, you've talked about it before, a Bo honeymoon where, you know, when Bo had Bill Callahan's recruits, he was able to make them just this amazing team. And back when our defense, you know, was the best defense in the nation. So we could see something like that happen where he comes in and Nebraska at least has immediate success. There's a lot of... There's yeah, there was. I would say going back to that, like, no-win UCF team, I don't think that's really predictive of the talent that was at UCF. Don't forget Georgia O'Leary in 2013. They won the Fiesta Bowl against Baylor 52-42. to And the year before the, like, 0-12 season, they were still, like, 9-4 and in the American Conference. They're still playing in a bowl game. Mm-hmm. That was not a team devoid of talent. He came to there was talent on the roster. I think Scott Frost obviously is a top choice for many Nebraska fans. He's done a great job with the offense at Oregon. He's going to develop quarterbacks. I think he'll be a great candidate there. I think someone else at Nebraska would probably look at be Justin Quinte if for some reason Frost stayed at UCF or did not come to Nebraska. Very interesting job. He's down at Virginia Tech. Um, I see 
So, um, Craig, wait. What are your – do you think Scott Frost is the right coach, though? I think he probably will be the right coach. I think he'll be able to unify some of the people who want more of an old-school offense, people on new-school offense. He's kind of a Tom Herman, should you say, of this coaching carousel. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, similarity I can see between uh, Mike Riley and Bill Callahan. Not necessarily great coaches, and especially since – you know, Mike Riley with his pro-style offense. Bill Callahan kind of ran a similar – because Bill Callahan – he was an NFL – Bill Callahan is currently an NFL coach. He's getting a lot of praise right now in the NFL. He's doing a successful job, and I believe if Mike Riley went to the NFL, he could potentially do the same thing. But I'm straying away from Mike Riley here. I think that um, not only were they good coaches, they were really good recruiters. Well, I think the thing about Mike Riley and Bill Callahan having the success, like those guys – you know – Let's just focus in on Mike Riley. He's more of a coach that likes to praise the guys to do a good job and, you know, love what you do. And I think if he would go up to that next level, I think it would kind of go away from the more, like, coaching part of it, honestly. Like, the guys, once you get into the NFL, they don't really need that coaching. It's more just the training. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem down here is the college guys need the coaching. They need the experience from a coach who knows what they're doing, and I think in the NFL it's kind of just a given of the players knowing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's just going out there and, you know, having a coach that knows how to root them on and keep them going. Put them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the NFL, you, I mean, you said it perfectly, you know, with college you got to coach guys up. you got people that still haven't peaked athletically. Their bodies are still maturing. Some guys are still growing a couple inches mm -hmm. in college. In the NFL, you just got to tell them where to be and when to be there. Yeah. They just got to – once they're in the right position, they're going to make the plays. And that's the thing. I mean, you – I think Mike Riley did a good job on keeping the players prepared in an aspect of, you know, knowing what their assignment is. I think it's more just them wanting it. I mean, when we saw Nebraska play, it was like you saw a lot of guys on the field – just look like they're giving up on plays and, you know, not having that emotion. But I think once you get on to the next level, obviously the players are going to bring it every play. They know what they're playing for. They're playing for millions of dollars. Yeah. They know that if they don't do their job alone, they're not going to be playing. Yeah. I think in college, more you're relying on some of your assistants. I do not think Nebraska had quality assistants during Mike Riley's tenure, especially at the defense and offensive coordinator positions. <laughs> Danny Langsdorf obviously made has made some very questionable decisions play calling wise, and Mark Banker was not good. Bob Diaco was not good this year. So Mike Riley takes a lot of heat for that. I don't think mm -hmm. he was the uh, main like brain trust wanting Bob Diaco. I think that was yeah. more Sean Eichhorst. So there, I mean, Mike Riley was in the NFL, but he did have Ryan Leaf as his quarterback. So there was some friction there. I don't think he was really prepared for that. I mean, that's it's just tough for Mike Riley. He's one of the one of the nicest guys in college football, as people say. I mean, people did not start giving up. I think on the team, but that could have also been more from outside fan support, just saying like from week two or three, he's going to be fired. He's going to be fired eventually. I think that gets to you as players, especially mm -hmm. when the season starts cool. going as bad as it did after they lost to Northern Illinois. You're right, because like not only are they playing for you know get to a bowl game, because it was obvious that we were going to be scrapping to even try to get to a bowl game, yeah. which we didn't get to. But they're also playing to keep their coaches' jobs. So I, and, you know, I, to add on to that, kind of, it, you got to look at the schedule. I mean, I know we lost games we weren't supposed to lose. But then again, you look at our schedule. I mean, the Big Ten is arguably the best conference in college football right now. I'd say we're probably the most competitive up and down. I mean, given – a couple teams, but I feel like us. You, yeah, I feel like you can kind of get a sense that anyone can beat anyone in the Big Ten. I mean, we saw Iowa destroy Ohio State, and then Ohio State, you know them, they bounce right back, and they're probably, you know, they have a real good chance to make the college football playoffs if they beat Wisconsin. And then Iowa, which we could see. Purdue. Yeah, I mean, I feel like really anyone can beat anyone in the Big Ten. And with that said, I feel like all teams are competitive in the Big Ten despite the records given the Nebraska's, Maryland's, and Rutgers, you know, teams like that. But, yeah, I think the Big the Big Ten is a really competitive conference and, you know, kind of just going along with what you said. The thing that really does stink, I mean, not only were we 4-8, but we very easily could have been 1-11. and 11. 
first game, yeah. took a fourth down stop on the goal line, yeah. beat Arkansas State. You look at Rutgers, that game was close. I think we were losing ten at some point, point game, but ten point yeah, game, still. but we had to pull away at the end yeah. to win it. And then you look at Purdue, obviously the eleven point comeback. The only real game that was like, wow, we just beat them was Illinois. Yeah. And Illinois was one and eleven. So we could have been one of those, and we, we didn't even, it was 28-6. to six. Uh-huh. I mean, I understand that, yeah, we beat them by three touchdowns, but. <laughs> it was know, still a competitive game yeah, I mean, our, early our, on. It's our 90s team. That's a, you know, 70-0 to zero game yeah. where our third stringers are putting up huge numbers. I mean, yeah. Uh, and another thing about that is we saw Baylor go 1-11, which. You know, I wouldn't say it took us by surprise. You know, obviously they've had some troubles in their school. Yeah. But to see a program like Baylor that was playing against Michigan State number eight versus number five just two or three years ago, to see them go one and eleven, it really caught me by surprise. And then, you know, sure enough, every week we saw Baylor lose, lose, beat Kansas, lose, lose. Ooh. And, you know. Yeah. I think that's really tough. I think if you're going to look at Mike Harley's defining point in his career, if you back in 2016 when we played Wisconsin, oh, yeah. we were undefeated. We were ranked real high. I think if we win that game, I think we carry a little more momentum into going to Ohio State. Yep. If we lose that, we're still only one last team going through the rest of our schedule. We think the Iowa game would have meant a little bit more to the players. And that's, that's kind true. of the what if. I mean, they had a chance in overtime. I mean, Wisconsin didn't miss that extra point, so if they could have converted there. Maybe that'll be different. But I think when people aren't looking at for next year, it's a brutal season. Yeah. <laughs> you have Colorado. You're playing at Michigan. You're playing at Wisconsin. You're playing at Northwestern. You have home against Minnesota, at Ohio State, home against Michigan State, and you're finishing with Iowa in Kinnick Stadium. That's so, not, I mean, a, that's not our, a favorable schedule. All our tough conference out. games are against – or all our away conference games are against the best opponents. But on the bright side, at least you get, you know, the – Easy wins at home, so usually, hope. I mean, nothing's an easy win in yeah. Nebraska, but. And, you know, the thing about that is, you know, sadly we could call it a rebuilding year, but I think the thing about that is if Scott Frost can prove himself worthy to get these players coached up and ready for the big games that we're going to see this year, mm-hmm. and at least win two or three of those, I mean. Or just compete. Yeah. You know, I let's mean, not get blown out. If he can compete, keep it close, win a couple of those close games, I think it's going to really just change the tide of Nebraska and what we've seen from the fans. You know, kind of the torn, you know, decisions on what the fans want and what they don't want. I think it'll bring us together if he can scrap across a couple wins, you know, on the road, a couple of the tough road tests, and, you know, kind of turn this around next season. I think if, if you're any coach if, that comes If he was hired. Yeah. Yeah. Any That's coach true. that comes in next year, don't look at the record because – I think six wins would be a good season next uh-huh. year, especially with all the transfers that are probably going to happen, kids that, you know, decommit. Let's give it two, three years, but just wait and see what happens the uh, first year. Just can't, how are we prepared? Is our team playing with a lot of passion? Are we in the right position? Are we able to hang with Ohio State at least until the third, fourth quarter and show some fight? But I, I think Bob Diaco's quote, uh, I think it was two days ago. It was probably the best thing I've heard through you know this kind of abysmal season. It was, you know, we're four and eight. Obviously, that's not Nebraska football. I want to get to the point where we're disappointed if we're eight and four. And mm-hmm. I just like that attitude that he had because I, of course, never really showed that passion. I, I believe it. Bill Moose is the one that said that. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill Moose. I don't even know if I said. Yeah, and I mean, you know, really, it's all speculation right now. Uh, a lot of people can say Scott Frost is going to be our coach, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to what his decision is himself. There's going to be a lot of people that talk, a lot of media, and you know, overall, I just think us Nebraska fans are going to have to wait. I think Bill Moose actually has us in the right direction. He's waiting, finding his right candidate that he wants, and I think you know, at the end of the day, he's going to find the right guy, and you know. I think that's really all we have to talk about. Uh, Can I just, have anything else? I just got one thing here. Um, Nebraska's new interim head coach, Trent Bray, 
who is this guy? First of all, I've never seen this dude in my life, and I was he's the he's the linebacker coach. He is actually considered for I believe a San Jose defensive coordinator job last year. He has connections to Bill Moose. I think his uh, I think his dad was a coach under him at one time in school. But he's a very interesting guy. I mean, he's a pretty young linebacker coach. He's considered probably one of the more like rising star coaches. I mean, okay. Nebraska, was, Nebraska linebackers, I mean, didn't have that terrible of a year. If you look at, like, Chris Weber and Chris Weber was Marcus Newby and people like that. So well, I don't think McNair, it was really or, on him. No, he was fullback. No, yeah. but... I mean, Luke Gifford. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think he is a uh, decent... I think he would not probably stay, though, under a new regime. I don't think he really has too many connections to Nebraska outside of Mike Ryan. I've that. heard rumors that uh, possibly Riley as a... Uh, Recruiting coordinator, we're already paying him enough. One thing I do want to know, um, <laughs> to kind of tie up this, <laughs> I know this podcast is trying to wrap things up here, but I just want to, I just got one question. What do you think is going to happen to the other staff of the, the other coaches on this Nebraska oh, team? Oh, most of them are fired. Bob Diaco, and you got oh, all Keith gone. Williams, and you got all these Keith other. Keith Williams, Dante, and Perel are probably the only ones I would look at possibly keeping. Uh-huh. Dante's an ace recruiter. I think Keith Williams has probably done the best job of anyone on that staff, like developing J.D. Steele and Stanley oh, yeah. Morgan, the wide receiver room. He's a great recruiter. I don't think Perella has shown as much on the field yet, but I can't really blame him. I mean, he was brought in for a 4-3 system. They switched to 3-4. I don't think really he can take much of the brunt of the blame for that. I think every other coach on that staff, though, probably has yeah. little to no chance. Well, I think if Williams saves a lot of the play for Stanley. Not even just wide receivers, but it seems like he's just – he's that coach you go to if you need someone to lighten the mood or just help out with life events and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. He was the, say, the Cal Jacobs of their team. Yeah. The, the Miller West football coach <laughs> here. Very uh, very funny guy. Lighten the mood at practice a lot. Just kind of that kind of presence yeah. that your team is very good. Yeah, I, and I think you see that it's the receivers and how they play. They've run through a brick wall for them easily. Oh, yeah. So – you guys got anything else to add on to the topic today? Jaden, go ahead. Uh, let's hope that next time we do this, Scott Frost is our head coach and we lose guys. Absolutely. I'm, it's tough. We're in a tough situation, and uh, I can only hope for the best for our program, especially since we'll be going off to college next year. We'll be able to watch oh, yeah. them ourselves, you know? Yeah, I hope the Husker fans can remain with class. I know Mike Riley had to get escorted out after that final Iowa game, so I hope that uh, – they stay classy. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, like you guys said, tough time in Nebraska right now, but we can just hope for the best. Yeah, at least we're not Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, folks. I think that's all we have here today. Thank you guys for watching. This has been J.D. Wessel. Jamie Cover, Andrew Pfeiffer. Craig Sullivan. With the Wildcat Breakdown. We'll see you guys later.